Welcome back to our third course in the do-it-yourself form-based code. In the last course, we covered the major steps that are necessary for developing a solid code. These steps are fundamental and are practiced in virtually all form-based code efforts. And in our work for the hypothetical town of Wrightville, we were no different. We started our effort by working with the community to develop a vision. We talked with the citizens and the town leaders and determined what they wanted to see in the future. This vision detailed three basic zones, the suburban, urban, and urban core. These three zones were what the citizens wanted to see built, and when we asked them to identify the best parts of their town, they gave us areas that embodied the best characteristics and functions for each of these respective zones. We then visited those areas and gathered a detailed inventory for how each area had been built over time. This inventory became the foundation for our initial form-based code by providing us the average measurements that could become our values for each of the rules that we have in place for the code. Through a very long and productive dialogue with the citizens, everyone eventually came to a final vision they determined exactly the type of form that they wanted out of their three zones and where they wanted it to be applied. This brought us to the closing part of our last course and we found ourselves at that point with a standard form-based code that could arguably be considered complete. After all, at the end of that course we had developed a vision, a regulating plan, a collection of well-established rules, and had worked with the community to establish all of these things through a very iterative, very public-oriented process. And isn't that all that we're supposed to do in making a form-based code? Well, not for us. After all, we have written enough policy to know that the first draft of a code is seldom, if ever, as effective as we want. Very few codes do exactly what we want when we first write them. Indeed, our first draft can often contain elements that even run contrary to what we intend. This, of course, relates to a very well-known law, something known as the law of unintended consequences. This law sort of explains the manner in which our intervention into complex systems always create unanticipated and often undesirable outcomes. This law is present in every public policy that has ever been written, whether we know it or not. And it is something that we must work very hard to avoid. We don't want to expose our dear old town to the unknown externalities that can accompany most public policy efforts. And thankfully, we can do something about that. We can do a bit of additional work to make sure that we avoid as many of those consequences as possible. Our process for doing so is very similar to what we'd find in the software development world, where code writing takes on a whole other level of sophistication. Again, when we ended the second course, we had essentially developed what could be known as the pre-alpha prototype, an early version of our final product. And we are now ready for the alpha and beta testing phases. You see, just like a computer programmer, we can write our code and we can test it. We can test it like a programmer to find the bugs, the flaws in the system that we have devised. That's our alpha phase. We then make fixes, we test again in the beta phase, and then make our final refinements before we go live or hit gold with the final product. Again, our process here is similar to what occurs in software development, only it has never really been done this way, especially with zoning ordinances in the past. But why is that? There is one big reason. Many of the elements within a zoning ordinance are not easily testable since the policy writers who write a zoning ordinance are never really definitive in what they hope to accomplish. Zoning after all, focuses on vague ideas of land uses and only specifies the things that we don't want. There is seldom, if ever, a case where these ordinances define what we do want. 
But our form-based code has a clear, measurable outcome, and thus we can test it. We can't just test for what we want to see, though. We also have to account for randomness. Ask any local government planner, and they'll tell you that they often see projects that they would never have predicted or even thought possible. They see things they could never have anticipated. A sign on a building, for example, is never really just a sign, not when someone has some imagination. And multifamily next to single family isn't necessarily bad until someone forgets how it can manifest. These unforeseen and unintended outcomes are never addressed in a code. But it isn't just the bad outcomes that we unfortunately allow at times. Sometimes there are good outcomes that we actually don't allow. And all of this is because we don't account for the unintended consequences of the policies that we write. Consider, for example, all the zoning ordinances in place today that did not account for the terrific development patterns that we planners now want to see. Things like neo-traditional development and mixed use. Think of all the environments that we still cannot build because of our short-sighted and overly prohibitive ordinances that didn't think that we'd want walkable communities or complete streets or something like seaside. So we ended up writing policies that stopped things that were good, even though we didn't intend it. How can we avoid such consequences again? How can we make sure that our outcomes can be achieved in our new code? How can we make sure that our work will be effective? By taking the chapter from the software developers, we will test our codes and do our best to have answers to these questions.